Morning all. I had an interesting club game last night. Barnet were playing Royston at home. OK, let's have a look at this game. With White I kicked off against Kevin Clark with Knight F3. Uh, my opponent's of special significance actually because at the end of last season um, he, he did crush me badly and there's a video for that uh, previous game encounter. But it did get me thinking about access paths which I enjoyed using the concept of access paths in Blitz Chess in particular. And at the start of this season was was still experimenting with the concept in a couple of longer games and I found it wasn't that effective. Um, so the theme of this game I, I wanted to set was, was trying to uh, uh, reduce counterplay and um, the games, I think games of Salt and Cartons reinforced that to a certain extent, but positional players just trying to reduce counterplay. I mean that is more important for longer games as opposed to blitz chess. Uh, and it gives a sense of calmness uh, to the play and if, if you're not too concerned that the opponent hasn't got amazing tactical resources for example, you can be a bit calmer. So Knight F3 is a quiet start to the game and he plays D5 and I play D4 and yes I'm just politely sort of intensifying a little bit of pressure on the dark squares and you might think well this isn't a wild E4 opening or anything but sometimes uh, by keeping the tension it's more dangerous than an explosive all out game from the start. We see an innovative move Bishop F5 here now and I think this this could have you know gone into a shagoring with Knight C6 if I play C4 and I'm a bit worried about what am I walking into? Has has Kevin prepared this? Is is there going to be something nasty later? Um, so actually, I didn't really want to commit the pawn just yet to c4. I played actually bishop f4, and again, I'm just politely intensifying pressure on dark squares and trying to get uh, you know a grip on the position, a good grip on the position. And here actually he plays c6, so I know that knight c6 is going to be ruled out. So I'm not so concerned about frontal pressure on my d pawn here. So here I do venture the move c4 because in a way I want to play something like queen b3 and expose the fact the bishop's not defending b7. And on queen b6, I was thinking, you know, c5, accept the double pawns, then play for b4, b5 later is a standard way of playing that. But, um, Kevin plays now queen b6 immediately himself and this this is quite awkward because for example queen b3 here then d takes c I thought uh, because then b2 is is a problem here perhaps and I don't really want to take that I'm pawned down he's going to have the a-fold dynamism himself it's not me having it so I thought queen b3 in this position is not adequate and knight c3 doesn't also seem uh, adequate, I thought, because queen b2, and he can explode with e5 here, and then bishop b4, perhaps, to try and ex exploit this 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 bishop not really helping c3 here. I thought this type of position I've got to avoid as well. Uh, it's not that pleasant. So the move I came up with in this position, believe it or not, is knight bd2, just offering b2 here. And it's not entirely clear if it can be taken here. I think we should do a second technical pass on this. I mean, it might be quite dangerous to take it um, because uh, basically, uh, just just very very briefly, C D and E four. I mean, this is something I looked at during the game anyway, a little bit. That I have Rook B one, and I have potential for Bishop B five check. So I wasn't entirely sure this this was that hot. Uh, for black to take that pawn, it might be a little bit poisoned. Um, so he plays e6, and I had a little bit of regret, to be honest. That well, maybe I should have, I should have, maybe I missed out on something. Maybe I thought perhaps c takes d would have been better to force c takes. But then on the other hand, this position, black doesn't like have to take here. And okay, although he had, you know, although this diagonal is more sensitive, he can use that c6 square. So knight c6, so it sort of swings and roundabouts. That, that's quite annoying. For example, you know this this might be annoying. Knight b4 here. Mind you, there's check bishop d7. Well, anyway, it's not all that bad if c takes d. I am releasing 
you know, this knight to c6 potentially. So knight bd2 might not be that terrible. But uh, as I say, we'll do a second pass uh, later. So e6 was played, and now I do play queen b3, knowing that, of course, my c4 is guarded by the knight. And he did take on b3, giving me a little bit of a file dynamism, also I thought. But now the idea is revealed. He plays knight a6, and the knight's seemingly very comfortably coming to b4 in front of the double pawns, threatening knight c2. Okay, so it doesn't look entirely uh, convincing here to play the move c5, for example. It seems to be out of the question in this position because of knight b4. But what I do here is actually play c takes d, okay. He plays e takes d5, keeping um, the center solid and avoiding any problem with this diagonal, potentially. But guess what move I do play in this position? Um, if I give you 10 seconds starting from now, you might want to pause the video. Okay, I play e4 here. And um, one thing about e4, it say, say he plays knight b4, I might be able to win material here after takes, check, king d1, knight takes a1, bishop d3. And this knight is kind of stranded. I'm going to play king e2 and munch this knight because it can't really win b3. He could try bishop b4, but it's protected by this knight. So I'm going to win this knight, I think. So I wasn't too worried by that. Uh, so that had to be factored in. Knight b4 here. But uh, he plays bishop takes e4. It might be better to play d takes e4. So bishop takes e4, and I can just inflict a lot of structural damage here now, and use that a file. Bishop takes a6, as if I've done a sort of minority attack. But I have got the double pawns to factor in. Takes Now I just take on e4, takes, and although I'm a pawn down, it's a lot of structural damage. My pieces are out and active. Okay, so I, I liked my position. I think this next move from black didn't really help too much. Check. I just played king e2. I've connected my rooks. I've got access to c1. So I thought I was doing well at this point. Knight e7. And I take on a6. I've got my pawn back and I'm looking forward to trying to win a pawn. He keeps material same. He plays c5. Now in the second pass, I think there are other moves. I very, very briefly uh, checked this game of an engine before showing this. but. In the second pass, we'll look at other moves, but I thought this was an interesting move and logical. Just to play d takes c5 here. Uh, after bishop takes c5, I can harass that bishop, rook c1, and harass it again with knight c4 now, threatening knight b6. And the interesting thing here, I thought, is I thought castles is almost ruled out because bishop d6, rook e8, I take here, and then I use that pin, knight takes b6. So I thought casting's like ruled out here. So I was very pleased with that. He plays actually the move knight c8, which I find a little bit surprising. Maybe I was expecting possibly knight d5 might might be better. So knight c8 looks on the passive side. So I'm very happy with my position here uh, from the opening, even though it's a quiet opening. You know, he hasn't yet castled. Um, I've got my, my rooks and my pieces are all having a good time in this position. I take on b6 and after knight takes b6, bishop e3, so I'm still targeting trying to win a pawn potentially at this point. But after knight d5, my strat my strategic attention is, is, is thinking should I win the pawn or should I do something better, trying to stop the opponent's counterplay. And there's a move which I think shows some degree, um, you know, th this balance of, of material versus counterplay removal. I wonder what move you would play in this position if I gave you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, I play the move bishop c5. I don't have to win the pawn. Yep. My opponent might have frontal plate pressure later on on these double pawns with rook b8 at some point. 
But bishop c5 actually stops him from casting, and you might think, well, it's simplified, isn't it, an end game anyway? But um, you know, it's only two rooks and a, and, a, and a piece each. But it's still difficult if the rooks are not connected here. He plays check. After king e3, knight d3 looks dangerous, but I just play now in this position. Well, I wonder if you can guess when I play in this position. Okay, rook c4. So I'm keeping the bishop protected. And I've got pressure on e4 here. And his position uh, is starting to be a little bit wobbly. He plays the move f5. And now, in this position, it's starting to be very, very pleasant for me. Extremely pleasant. Surprisingly so, perhaps, um, after this next move uh, that I played. But I think there's at least one or two good moves, actually. Um, here, but uh, guess try and guess the move that I played. If I give you ten seconds, starting from now. Okay, again, I'm not that concerned about material. I'm more concerned about counterplay removal. That's the theme of the game that I, I wanted to set out the agenda for this game on a fundamental level. So I want to reduce counterplay. So I play the move bishop a3, which again stops the rooks from easily connecting. He can't castle. And king f7, there's now rook c7 check, driving the king back, because this rook's covering that sixth rank. So the rooks are beautifully coordinating here. He plays king d7, as though the rook's coming out. And for a moment I was a bit concerned here. Hold on, what have I done? The rook's coming out. Whoops. I haven't even won a pawn. I've, 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 and he's got a knight on d3. What have I done? The rook's coming out. But there's a move which changes the picture, which which calms me down a bit, finding. Okay, no panic, no panic. Okay, I haven't taken my, my pawn. He's got a knight on d3, but, but, returning to the original frame, disconnect the rooks. Disconnect these rooks. How would you do that? If I give you 10 seconds, starting from now, what would you play here? Okay, I play check. Delighted to find this. If king e7, rook takes d3, discovered check. So the king's forced back. Rook's disconnected again. Goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> Instead of hello, hello. Okay. And my rooks are having a good time. Rook c7, rook on the 7th. All these pawns to target as the invisible stage. Statistically, all the pawns are on the second rank. The king's restricted. The rooks are disconnected. Fantastic. Look at the quality difference. This knight is the only aggressive piece, but even that is tactically threatened. And in fact, I start exposing the knight. He plays a5, and I play, instead of taking here, I'm thinking again, counterplay removal. Uh, I don't want any cheeky checks to win f2, even if the knight does manage to stumble back, which he probably can't. But I want to actually target this knight here. So I play the move f3. This knight's very wobbly. But I did miss this next move. Uh, this bishop's really nice on this diagonal, and he plays knight b4, interrupting the bishop. But still, my rooks are enough here. I just take on b4, I take on e4, leaving a weak e pawn, and I take my first pawn. For the first time, I'm a pawn up here. And the problem for black is, if he tries to win um, this one, I mean, it's nice the double pawns, I'm protecting a3 here with this one. But even so, you know, rook b6, if it's too slow to play rook a2 here because of rook b6 threatening mate, for example, it looks too slow. Uh, so his rooks uh, have a problem. He plays rook f8, and I don't want any rook f7s. So I play check to make sure there's no rook f7s before munching my second pawn. And I'm going to get a third pawn here. And. Okay, he might have rook a2, but in this position, he's had enough. He resigned. So, yeah, I, I was really happy. I was really happy with this game because, in some aspects, I, I didn't go for material. I went for counterplay removal, and it seemed to be more, more important. Um, it's good that I had the rook d6 resource, otherwise, maybe I would have regretted not winning his a7 pawn. You do need technical resources to try and. Uh, fulfill the dream um, you need to find those it's you know you do need tactical awareness but um, the dream is fulfilled I'm starting to win more and more material and these pawns are ready to, to drop off soon 
in this position you might think rook a2 but maybe rook b6 king c8 we'll, we'll check this out it's plus two okay so okay let's go with rook a2 as an example rook b6 king c8 they're going to take here he takes this one All right, if I have to play g4, that was rook f3 potential. I suppose rook f3 is just harmless. He's going three pawns down in this ending. Um, but uh, so that that secures the rook by protecting it. Okay, g5 here. It is three pawns down. It's it's not entirely pleasant for black anyway. So you might think, okay, let's try rook a. Just for the record, let's try um, rook. A one, rook b six again. I'm threatening mate, so king c eight to stop the mate threat. His rooks, okay, they are out and about, but it is at a big cost of, of several pawns. And um, okay, I don't think his checks are that necessarily uh, scary here. Although. You know, perhaps he could have he could have played on, but he's a lot of material down. With with accurate play, clearly, um, I'm I'm got all the pawns basically. <laughs> okay, so he resigned in that position, and that was great. Um, and actually, we had been completely outrated on the five board match last night. They had an international master on board one, Richard Tozer. Um, who, by the way, beat Michael Adams once. Uh, it was on a demo board at Lloyd's Bank Masters. I think we should do that in tribute to Richard Tozer. I think it's one of his immortal games. So that could be an immortal game series. Just because it was, I so vividly remember it. It was on the demo boards in the Lloyd's Bank Masters days. And those games, you know, to me, you know, I'm always going to remember that game. It was really dramatic at the time. But anyway, Richard Tozer was for them on board one. He's about 215. So he was playing Alex, who's about 190 at the moment. Uh, Roy Royce, Al board two Roy Royce was playing David Coleman who's two one five. He won like a rating prize last um year in the London Classic under twenty two hundred section, I think. Or was it twenty two fifty? So he managed to beat David Coleman. So I won on board three. We lost on board four. David Holton was playing um a one nine four on board four and they had a one eight six on board five who our one sixty drew so entirely outrated in this little five board match, and we managed to to beat them and this this was key you know we needed every every win we had two wins, one loss, two draws, so this really helped, and this was the first game to finish but anyway, so let's do a technical analysis so let's see let's see so c four queen b six I played the move. And it's not it's not mentioned by the engine here. Engine thinks queen d two. Now is there some sort of problem with a bishop b four or not? Because you can imagine bishop b four being quite painful here. Now if there isn't a problem with this, uh then queen d two is fine. And apparently c five here. Yes, this makes e5 look unsound. This looks just terrible for black. Not what black really wanted. In fact, is bishop h3 really strong here? It does stop the knight d7 natural move. So that would be nice. I didn't really think about queen d2, and that's worth considering if. If you have this position, apparently queen b d two. So I played knight b d two, which apparently isn't such a bad move. Let's see the true horrors of knight c three here. I think just taking. And if here, I think it starts to get horrendous. It's it's not. It looks as though I am actually a pawn down here. If I play a routine move, I'm going to get smashed surely. If I play c five here to stop bishop b four, it does look as though. The compensation is to be proven here for that b2 pawn. So let's let's go back. So knight b d2. He plays actually. Um, 
so knight b2 is probably better than knight c3 anyway. So I play um, knight bd2 instead of knight c3. So I've got a tiny advantage it seems. e6. Now queen b3 which might not be the best move. But queen c1 looks a little bit poxy to be honest at this depth anyway. The engine recommending queen c1 looks a little bit poxy. But it might be threatening cd because of cd queen c8. So I guess it's not all that bad. Another interesting move, knight h4 here. What will black do if black wants to retain the bishop? I can munch that bishop. And and taking on b2, I can always got the point is I've got rook b1 here because that bishop's gone. So this this is good play on, on the queen side. I have the, the bishop pair and the queen's out of place and there's pressure and that's I think might is better there. It looks good. So anyway, queen b3 might not be the best move at all, and it seems as though the engine actually prefers black here. So better moves apparently knight h4 here. I was thinking about something like or if he took g4 actually, I remember during the game looking at g4s if he took on b2. Um so how would that go? For example, e3 takes g4 here. And bishop c2 though, it's it's not pleasant. You know, he is he is getting his material and getting even more material now with bishop a3. Bishop a3 here is is crushing. So this g4 concept is not working very well. I think the engine's idea of knight h4 achieves the same goal without getting a completely lost position. Um, so in this position, the move knight h4 might be might be interesting. But what about actually? I think I actually had looked at knight h4 here, and and did see queen d4. I remember now, e3, and I thought queen f6 here, and black would be okay. Just just material up. But what is actually happening here? Knight takes f5. Let's go with. Queen takes f5 to keep the structure intact. Queen b3. This isn't so clear. The queen's gone on a long journey here, and I've got queenside pressure. I can still kick the queen. I think there might be some compensation here. Say bishop c5 is a routine move. There's pressure. There's pressure on the dark squares. Like bishop e5, for example. Here e4. I'm starting to bust out from the position. Black's lack of development is is starting to be evident. So that that's interesting as well. That knight h4 is actually technically possible without losing, not being so bad. I did see this queen d4 e3 queen f6 and I stopped there. So um. Okay, so I played the move queen b3. I thought that was relatively <clears throat> safe. He took. Took. Now you see the evaluation is only minuscule advantage for white and knight a6 is mentioned. Okay, but um this is interesting now. That is is my forcing sequence quite good here? I play c takes d5. He plays e takes d5. And now e4, is it really that good? It's equal now at least, or is it below equal? Minuscule, minusculely below equal. I think perhaps he didn't react to e4 with the correct response, which is not bishop takes e4. I think bishop e4 does give white something. D takes e4 objectively seems better. So say I take knight e5. This is an improvement, and we check this out after the game, and it looks like an improvement. To keep this light square bishop, but actually look at white having a small advantage technically now. Let's go with this bishop e3. That's structural damage. Who's who's worse structurally here? White with the double pawns or black with the double pawns and c6? Or is it because of the peace pressure which really makes the difference? The rooks are more active, but knight b4 could be a pain. Start attacking c6 again. G4 here. 
Winning this pawn, winning some material back. What happens if it takes? Well, you can't take there because it's protected. If f6, is that a terrible move? Knight c4. So white seems to be okay here. Okay, but it's much better for black than the game, though. Uh, this this idea keeping hold of the light square bishop does look a lot better than the game. So knight b4 is also a little bit of a pain, protecting both a6 and c6. So anyway, so maybe I was quite fortunate that bishop e4 was played. So I take on a6. If if we do go into knight b4, I think we'll find this isn't good as, as I mentioned. In fact, even stronger than e4, d takes c6. Ah, this is interesting because here there's a really crushing move. If it takes then cb, and that pawn is is uh, absolutely winning. So d takes c6 even stronger than e4 here. So it takes e4 here. And if, if black goes like that, I'm still winning that knight. It just might be an improvement, a slight improvement. King e2, there's knight d5 though here. G3, and I'm winning that knight. White should be okay. So, e, e, D, and now the move e4. Okay, so we have bishop e4, and so maybe that is the slight blunder. That I'm, I'm really, I'm okay here to be a pawn down for, temporarily. But I, I think he made things worth with check. It's just helping me that check. I've connected rooks. Hello, hello, and um, okay. I'm back on equal material, and my pieces look more energetic. So his pieces are a little bit sleepy. The rook's not connected yet. That's the big thing. Knight c4, threatening to win material. Now let's look at this. Was bishop d6 actually that powerful? I think it might be bishop d6. If he's forced for bishop d8, that's just nasty. Bishop c5. I mean, I'm just keeping the pin here. We'll just intensify the pressure. This just looks very awkward to have this pin, but that is um, okay. So I take on. He plays knight c8. If he plays knight d5, more energetic looking knight d5. Okay, let's take here. Now, if we take like this, then okay, a strong move to stop castling bishop d6 again. If King d7, Bishop e5, so I'm on g7. I've got time for Rook d1, maybe. Let's, for example, here or Rook c7, more importantly. This this sort of position again, the Rooks look really good compared to the Black Rooks. Okay, it looks it looks very awkward for Black this sort of position. So Knight d5 might not be that brilliant. Um, so after taking, and if, if taking here, check, then I don't mind the king coming up here, I think. So white should be a little bit better. But it's probably better than the game continuation. The, the game continuation was very, very difficult for black with knight c8. So I take on b6 and play. Bishop e3 looks as though it's materialistic versus the counterplay removal, which I, I found later to be very, very nice. So I can play the same idea here earlier. He could have maybe just castled here to minimize losses. If he just castles and just goes a pawn down, he can challenge these double pawns. They're not really an extra pawn, double pawns here. And he should be able to draw this. Unless, unless this is an end game where I can sort of protect this, get my king round, and start pushing it, it is a, an outside pass pawn scenario. Uh, so possibly white slightly better, but I'm not. 
entirely convinced. So, okay, so, um, no, but what he plays instead, and my attention now starts to be on counterplay removal. Um, thankfully, after knight d5, I don't go for the materialistic. Rook takes a7. Al although, um, let's have a quick check here, because I thought in the game, well, this pawn is restrained already. That's that's the problem. I can't really get a pawn to b6. So if he, he's going to get um, this knight, could be very tricky in the end game as well. For example, this position is it something really to write home about? I'm not entirely sure. So anyway, bishop c5 might actually be okay. It's the start of something big now. After check. Knight d3. I'm getting a very pleasant position, especially after this f5. This looks as though it really compromises Black's position. This f5. If you're just taking again, minimize losses, just sack the pawn and head for the front of the attack as quickly as possible. We'll, we'll sack this pawn and just go for the front of the attack on my double pawns. Should have been maybe easier, much easier for Black to try and draw. So it makes things a lot worse with f5, it seems. And now I've got a huge position on bishop a3 because the rooks are really coming in. Rook on the seventh, really powerful. This knight's a bit loose as well, not being able to take on b2 now. Um, the engine actually prefers even stronger bishop. Oh, now it prefers bishop a3. It mentioned bishop d6 earlier. Yeah, but bishop a3 seems from a human point of view logical we just protect the pawn still get the rooks in so I don't know bishop a3 is, is actually just seems sensible it gives way for rook c7 it stops black's rooks connecting uh, there's also annoying checks potentially with rook e6 so he tries to connect the rooks I kick the rook the king back rooks disconnected again rook on the seventh the advantage is absolutely pronounced here a5, I don't know what else black can do. Black looks a little bit helpless here without the rooks being connected. I'm playing like two rooks up at the moment with this knight even the tactical vulnerability. So f3 just undermining the knight. Um, maybe that, that is a good move, but maybe also, I mean, the check is tempting, but does it actually do anything? Not necessarily. My rooks are okay where they are. I can just undermine this knight, I thought. So f3. Okay, knight before was, was I didn't see knight before, but it doesn't really matter. The rooks are enough here, surely, to win this. I'm I'm going to be like three pawns up soon, or at least two pawns up if he wins a two. But um, I'm glad he did resign when he did because it uh, might might have been a little bit tricky. And it was, um, but it was we're we're in adjudication adjournment mode, not playing the the game on the night mode. There's, in the hearts league, you have that option at the start to agree with the opponent. I wanted to play to the finish on the night, but um, but uh, you can be overruled if the opponent wants a German or adjudication. But anyway, here, you know, at move 42, in, in any case, even if, um, you know, if I wanted, I could just adjourn at move 42. We're at move 31 at the moment, but he's going to be like, he's two pawns down, and it is, is pretty looking uh, bad. I guess he could have played on, um, but no, I think it is. It's at this level. I mean, we're, we're reasonably good club players, both of us. So I think, um, I think it was it was quite nice of him to resign here. Okay, so um, yeah, sweet revenge because last year he smashed me, and that's that is on YouTube as well if you want to check it out. Um, and he's he's the guy that influenced me with access paths. This this is the guy that uh, you know. Some of these Hearts League games, uh, they're a lot more influential on. On my fundamental ideas about chess, some of these these Hearts League games, and um, yeah, so it's a really it's a really fiercely contested league this year, with more than one team having an, an IM on board one, not just um, Hartford, but now you know Royston with uh, Richard Tozer. So um, okay, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.